Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So this is part two of my introductory lectures on Feynman diagrams. And let me quickly recap what we saw in part one. So I told you about Richard Feynman, who's one of the most famous physicists for a lot of good reasons. And we are interested in particular in what is now called Feynman diagrams, which are a graphical method to solve certain complicated equations. So in part one, I talked about a couple of quite simple examples. So the first one is when you want to solve the equation 1 minus a times x equals 1. You can actually also solve this uh, equation by iterations, and so you find that at least formally the solution is given by the infinite sum 1 plus a plus a squared and so on, which is called the geometric series. And I showed that if a is strictly between minus 1 and 1, then indeed you have equality between the series and 1 over 1 minus a. And the second example that was a bit more complicated is when you want to solve a quadratic equation ax squared minus x plus 1 equals 0. So we do have a formula for the solution, but you can also write this as the equation x is 1 plus ax squared. And now what you can do is replace iteratively the x on the right hand side by 1 plus ax squared. And I showed you a graphical way of doing this that amounted actually to uh, having terms indexed by trees, by binary trees. And the coefficient of a to the n was equal to the number of binary trees with n plus 1 leaves. And this number is known as the Catalan number, and we know how to compute these numbers. So today I, I want to talk about a model which is a bit closer to quantum field theory, though it will be related more to statistical physics than to quantum physics. But there is, in fact, an analogy between both fields. So somehow, formally, quantum physics is a bit like statistical physics, but for a temperature which is imaginary. So here I have plotted the time evolution of a mass uh, connected to a spring, so it can oscillate vertically like this. And we know how to describe the uh, time evolution of the mass. But now, how about when the mass is very small and it is immersed in a fluid at a certain temperature, and so it is subjected to collisions with molecules of the fluid. So then it's time uh, evolution will look more like something similar to Brownian motion. So it will have a lot of fluctuations and it's not really feasible to describe the trajectory in detail. So for that reason, we resort to a statistical description and that is what statistical physics does. And the way it works is the following. So first we look at the energy of the spring which is given by this formula, one-half times the swing constant times uh, the square of the elongation of the swing. So the elongation is the length of the swing minus its length at rest. And then the basic principle of statistical physics, called the Boltzmann-Gibbs principle, tells us that at equilibrium at temperature t, so measured in degrees Kelvin, so it should be a temperature scale that is zero at the absolute zero temperature, then the elongation will follow, if we observe it on a, an interval of time that is long enough, a normal distribution of mean zero and variance V, which is given by Kb, Boltzmann's constant, times the temperature over K. So what this means is that if I draw here my, so the density of the normal distribution, so it's 
proportional to exponential minus uh, the uh, energy, so it's exponential minus a constant times x squared. So here I've scaled everything uh, so that the, the unit is the standard deviation, the square root of the variance. Then the total area under this bell-shaped curve is equal to 1, and the probability that x belongs to an interval a, b, so I've chosen here a here and b here, that will be proportional to uh, the area that you see in dark orange there. So mean zero var and variance uh, v means that the, the mean value, the expectation of x is zero, and the expectation of the square of x is given by v. So in general, for the variance, I have to subtract the square of the expectation, well, but here it is zero, so the mean of x squared is v. So what this means is that I have a probabilistic description of the length of my spring on long time intervals. Now let us make the system a bit more complicated and let us look at a, a string of coupled springs. So these springs now, uh, they are st uh, each one is attached to a some some vertical uh, so it is below a certain point and I have a spring constant k1 here but the springs are also connected uh, so the masses are connected by springs with a second spring constant k2 and now the energy of the system is given by the following expression so okay there's a certain constant that depends on my choice of units and then I have a sum of position squared times k1, and that is the energy of the vertical springs. And then I have also a term which is proportional to the sum of the differences squared. And that is due to the interaction for the connecting springs. Now, actually, this energy, I can write it uh, in matrix form as E naught plus one half and then I can write this in like so the vector x1 xn times a certain matrix times x1 xn and what do I put in this matrix well I will put on the diagonal k1 And then the k2 will appear at uh, two places, so it will appear in the off-diagonal terms, like this. But it will also appear as minus 2 k2 in the diagonal. So I have this, uh, this matrix which has a lot of zeros elsewhere. So the point here is that it is something quadratic, something I can write as the position vector of the xi's times the matrix times the vector of the xi's. Now the Boltzmann-Gibbs principle in this case tells me that the um, probability to have a certain configuration will again be proportional to exponential minus a constant times the energy uh, but now this is a problem that depends on several variables and uh, the distribution I get the probability distribution is now what we call a multivariate normal distribution so it's a normal distribution in several dimensions in n dimensions and The important point is that actually this multivariate uh, normal distribution is completely specified <coughs> by what is called the covariances, which are so generalizations of the variances, which are these coefficients cij, which are the average of xi times xj. 
And the, the idea is that if Cij is positive, it means that X, Xi and Xj tend to have the same sign. If it's negative, they tend to have opposite signs. And if it's zero, there's no particular relation between the signs. So zero correlation is true if Xi and Xj are independent, but it doesn't imply they are independent. And what is the relation between uh, this covariance and uh, the, the energy? Well, if I call this matrix here, if I call this matrix capital K, then uh, C will actually be equal to the inverse of this matrix K. Now, here is an important theorem, which is called usually Wick theorem in physics, but also Isserli's theorem in mathematics, because it was first proved by a mathematician named Leon Isserlis. And it tells us the following thing on mean values, expectations of monomials, so products of the Xi. So first of all, if the number of variables is odd, then by symmetry the expectation of the product is zero. But the interesting case is when the number of variables is even. In that case, we have the following formula here for the expectation of the product. So you can write it as the expectation. So I, I single out one variable, the variable x1 here, and then I pair x1 with all other va variables, so like with x2 here, with x3 here, up to xn. And I take the expectation of x1 times the second variable, and then the expectation of the product of the remaining variables. And so you see, this gives me a link between this endpoint function and the n minus 2 or several n minus two point functions. And then by induction, we actually get a sum over all pairings. So let's look at a few examples. So if n is four, my formula will tell me that the expectation of x1, x2, x3, x4 is the sum of three terms. And these terms just involve all possible pairings so all possible ways of splitting the set 1, 2, 3, 4 and two disjoint sets with two elements. So graphically, I can represent this in the following way. So that's a notation for this four-point function, and it's given by a sum of three product of two-point functions like that. Now, let us look at another example. How about n equals 6? Well, by my formula here, I can express the expectation of x1 up to x6 in terms of two-point and four-point functions. And then the four-point functions, again, I can express in terms of two-point functions. And so the result is graphically that I get all these possible pairings of six points, and you can check that there are 15 of them. And by summing all these pairings, so for each pairing I have a product of two-point functions, of covariances, I, I get my six-point function. Now, one remark is that this result actually stays true if certain indices are the same. So, for instance, if I take the expectation of x1 to some power n plus 1 times x2 to some power m. And let me again expand with respect to x1. Well, I can pair x1 either with one of the n other x1s, and that gives me this term here. So there are n terms where I get the expectation of x1 squared times the expectation of the remaining terms. Or I can pair x1 with one of the m x2s, and that gives me this second term here. So let me give you a proof of this result in a simpler setting. So I'm going to assume that there's only one variable x. 
But once one understands the proof for one variable, it's quite easy to uh, generalize it if one knows, knows about calculus in several dimensions. So my claim is that if x follows a normal distribution with a certain variance v, then the average, the expectation of x to the n plus 1, can be expressed in terms of the expectation of x to the n minus 1 with this relation here. So how, how does it go? So x n plus 1 averaged, it will be given by a certain integral. So, so the integral will be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n plus 1 times the density of my normal law, which is exponential minus x square over 2v dx. And I have a certain normalization factor in front here, which will not be important for us. So, and here v, as we have seen, that is the expectation of x squared. Now, what I will want to do is do integration by parts. So to be on the safe side, uh, let me write this as a limit when L goes to infinity of the integral of the same thing from minus L to L. So again, I put my xn plus 1 times uh, the exponential. And now, I want to do integration by parts, so what I will do here is that I will write this as so the, the integrand here as minus vxn times minus 1 over v x exponential minus x square over 2v. And the reason why I do this is that uh, the second factor here is actually uh, integrable. So if I call this v of x, small lowercase v of x, and that u prime of x. So u prime is the de derivative of u of x, which is exponential minus x square over 2v. And v prime of x well, that is simply minus n v x n minus 1. So you see that that will give us this x n minus 1 in the result. Now, if I go on with my computation here, so I get the limit when l goes to infinity, 1 over n. So in integration by parts, I will have boundary terms. So the boundary terms are u times v uh, evaluate at the, at the boundary, so that will be minus vxn times uh, exp the exponential, evaluated in l and in minus l. And then I will have minus, but it, I will actually get a plus sign because v prime is negative, and the integral minus l to l of so v prime u, that will give me n v x n minus 1 times the exponential. And now the observation is that the first term here, as l goes to infinity, will actually go to 0 because the exponential dominates the polynomial term. And the other term, it will converge to n times v times the expectation of x n minus 1. So the result is that I get n times v times the expectation of x minus 1. And v being equal to x squared, I have shown my result. Now, actually, it's not hard to see that this can be generalized to any function f 
which does not grow too fast. So the expectation of x times f of x will be equal to the variance times the expectation of the derivative of f. All right, so now let us make the system a bit more complicated. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to assign to the vertical springs a different energy. So the springs are no longer linear, they are no nonlinear terms. So I still have the, the linear part here and I have a, so a, a part which in the energy is of degree 4. So a over 4 x i to the 4 and in that way the spring force will be given by minus k1 xi minus a xi to the 3. So I've written here a over 4 uh, to have a instead of 4a but okay that's not really important. So you see in this way we modified the system a little bit. We made it nonlinear and the point is that now the analysis of these uh, endpoint functions or two-point functions is much more complicated because the integrals are no longer Gaussian integrals. So here is uh, an important result which is due to Julian Schwinger and Freeman Dyson in the framework of quantum field theory, but it does apply here as well, and it says the following thing. So if I want to compute, now the brackets with a subscript A means that I take the expectation for the, the new Gibbs measure with the, the new energy. So the energy has the, these additional terms of uh, the form constant times xi to the, th uh, to the 4. So the claim is that I first get two terms and these terms are exactly in fact the same we had uh, we would have without coupling. So it's basically uh, the remark I made just before. And then we have these additional terms here and these are due to this new coupling x cube here. So just a remark, I have assumed here that my Boltzmann constant times temperature is equal to one, otherwise we have the same expressions, but we should replace A by A over KBT. So let me just give you a sketch of how uh, you obtain this, uh, this result. So it's, it's quite similar to the proof I gave of the isserly swick theorem. So I want to compute xi to the n plus 1 times xj to the m, but now averaged with the new Boltzmann-Gibbs measure. And so uh, what what gives me this expectation? Well, it is given by an integral where I, I put xi to the n plus 1, xj to the m. And then uh, I have to put the, the new energy, but I can write it as the coupling part, uh, the new part, and the, the old part. And then I have to divide by the same expression without the powers of x. So I have exponential minus w, exponential minus e. So and what is w of x here? Well, that is the, the new part of the energy due to these nonlinear terms. So w of x is given by, uh, so it was a over 4 times x1 to the power 4 plus and so on up to xn to the power 4. All right, uh, but now 
you see, uh, since I've written these two integrals with respect to the old, to the Gaussian measure, I can actually write this as a ratio of so expectations under this Gaussian measure just by adding this W term here. So like this for the numerator and for the denominator. And <coughs> now I can do something quite similar to what I just did for this Isserly Swick theorem. So so the, the numerator I can express express as so let me write a sum sign here. So I sum over all uh, indices and then I, I will have the covariance C I K and then the uh, expectation of the derivative with respect to xk of so I have isolated one copy of xi and I will have the remainder which is xi to the n xj to the m exponential minus w of x and now I use the Leibniz rule to expand this derivative of a product and then what do I get? I get the derivative of xi to the n xj to the m times the exponential and this gives me the, the first two terms here in my equation. So Actually, this derivative is non-zero only if k is equal to i or j, and then you, you get that result. And then I get another term, which is the expectation of xi to the n, xj to the m. And then I have the derivative of exponential minus w of x. And what is this derivative? So I have the expression of W here. So this derivative is actually minus A xk to the 3 e to the minus W of x. So in the second term I can again view the, this as expectations under the new measure and it will give me these terms here. So the additional xi to the 3 is due to uh, this new term in the energy. All right, so now let's apply this to a few examples. So the first example will be that I take n equals 0, m equals 1. And just for simplicity, I've chosen i equals 1, j equals 2, but we can easily apply this to the general case. Then uh, what does my formula give? Well, the first term here uh, isn't there because n is 0. The second term gives me 1 times c12 times the expectation of, uh, so what will it be? So uh, it will be actually the expectation of 1, xj to the 0. And so it gives me just c12. And now the additional terms here, well, they give me a sum of terms. So minus a times c11 times the expectation of x2, x1 to the 3, plus and so on up to xn. So now the, the question is, of course, what, what are these new terms, these expectations of x2 times some xi to the power 3? Well, to see that, let us take n equals 0, m equals 
three in the Schwinger Dyson equations, and so I have here my expectation of x2 times xi to the three. And I can again apply my, my relation here, and let me just write the first term of order zero. What I get is three c2i times the average of xi squared, which is equal to cia, cii. So this is what I get at lowest order in A. And I could, if I wanted, go to higher orders. So if I plug this here in this equation here, I get the following relation. So up to first order in A, the expectation of x1, x2 under the new probability measures given by c12, which is the same under the old measure, minus a certain correction term, which is minus 3a times the sum of terms here. Now, the point is that if we go to higher orders, it is quite cumbersome to write all the c, i, i, c, i, j, and so on. And that is why one can use a graphical notation. So it's the following one. So let me represent the old average, so the covariances without the extra term in the energy between xi and xj by a blue line connecting points i and j. And for the same object but under the new probability distribution, I do the same but now I use a red wavy line. So somehow this red wavy line means that we take some additional interaction into account. So then my formula which was a bit long to write, which I just derived before, becomes the following thing. So you see the here I have just put the expectation of x1, x2 on the new measure. And it's given by the same under the old measure. And then I have a new term here, minus 3a times a certain sum. And you see the sum, it's all terms of the form c i c one i c i i c i two where i goes from one to n. And this I represent in the following way where the vertex in the middle, which has no label, means that I actually sum over all possible values. And the loop here corresponds to the c i i terms. And then I have a term of higher order of order a squared. Now, uh, what if I want to go to higher order, to order a squared? Well, you see, it means that I would have to compute the term of order a here, because it will give it a term of order a squared there. And for that, I still have to apply these Schwinger Dyson equations, and I get a new expectation which I will have to compute by once again applying the theorem here. So let me not do the computation, but the result you get is the following. So the first two terms I, I already know, and then I get some additional terms of higher degree, of higher order in A. And in principle, I could keep doing this for higher orders, except that the computations become more and more complicated. However, uh, let us look in a bit more detail at this expression here, which I, I repeat here. So one thing you see is that all the inner vertices, so those which uh, which have no labels. So at order a, I have one inner vertex. At order a squared, I have two inner vertices, one, two, one, two, one, two. So we would expect that at order three, I have three inner vertices and so on. And the other thing you 
can observe here is that all the inner vertices have degree 4, meaning that each inner vertex is connected to four lines, which could be loops. So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And if you think about it, you get actually in this expression all possible graphs that follow these rules. So they have a certain number of inner vertices, which is fixed, and they are all of degree 4, and everything has to be connected. Now, how about these coefficients here in front? Well, you can actually also understand these in the following way. So, let me take again this, uh, this uh, diagram here. So, the point is that this is actually obtained by pairing a, a vertex with, a, with four edges like this in all possible ways with the points 1 and 2 and uh, in including the loops. Now, this point in the middle, this vertex has four legs. And I didn't say anything about which leg is which, but let me say that I label them A, B, C, D. And then what I, I can do is I can label, uh, so I can connect A to 1 and B to 2 and C to D. So that's one option. But it's not the only option. So, so how many choices do I have to connect the edges? Well, I have four choices for which leg I connect to one, and I have three choices for which remaining leg I connect to two, and then I have no more choice for the loop, and that gives me 12. And now the coefficient 3a here, that is actually 12 times a over 4, and the a over 4 was in my potential energy. Now let's look at another example. So if I take this, this diagram here, how many options do I have? Well, I actually have 12 times 12 options because for each vertex I have 12 ways of connecting the legs. And then the number of choices when I insert it in my formula, it will give me 12 times 12 times a over 4 squared, which is 9a squared. So that gives me this term here. And how about this diagram here? So for this diagram here, we have So for each of these two uh, vertices with four legs, what I have is uh, four choices for which leg I connect to one, four choices for which leg I connect to two, and then the three remaining legs have to be paired as well. And here the number of choices is ac actually three factorial which is 6. So I get 4 times 4 times 6 choices. And then if I compute 4 times 4 times 6 times a over 4 squared, that gives me 6a squared, which is what I have here. So you see that actually we see that all these terms have a combinatorial interpretation. So they're given by all possible graphs following certain rules and with a combinatorial factor which is due to this labeling the legs. So we can uh, think about what ha happens at higher order. So we could do the computation but instead of do doing the computation let us just look at what possible graphs we have. So now we look at graphs with two outer vertices, one and two, and three inner vertices. So one possibility is 
that they all make loops like this. So that, that's an option. Then I also have the option where I have one loop like this and here I have something like this. As we, we've seen a, a similar term with only the, the right hand double loop before. And of course I can do it the other way round. I could do this and this. Okay, but it's uh, not the only option. So another thing I could do is just put, just stack my three loops like that. But then there are, there are still more options. So what I could do is put my three vertices like this and pair them in the following way. And the symmetric thing, of course. So I could do this and that. Now, is this everything? No, actually, there, there's one more. And it's the following one. So let me draw it like this. Like this like this and like this. And then we can of course work out by the same method as before all these combinatorial factors and uh, we will get an expression for the term of order a to the 3. So to conclude now the one question we still have to ask is, does this series converge? So let me recall in the first part, we saw this geometric series and I showed that it converges if A is strictly between minus one and one. And we also saw, saw this quadratic equation and I showed that one possible solution of this equation, the following one, can be written as an expansion like that with, where the coefficients are cut along numbers. And this will at least converge if, okay, I take a positive so to avoid dividing by zero here, although that is not really a, a problem, but a has to be smaller than one quarter because when a is one quarter the square root here changes. And you can show that actually for all a between minus a quarter and a quarter, this uh, equality is true. Now, how about the model I've just described, which is uh, an example of what is called the phi four model in quantum field theory? Well, actually, you can show that the series will never converge. So, if you compute an infinite number of terms you will get infinity or something that oscillates between plus and minus a very large term. So series actually does not converge, but it's not such a necessarily a big problem. And there is an argument, an old argument given by the French mathematician Henri Poincaré, who said, okay, here are two possible series. So the first series uh, has a uh, terms, the nth coefficient has the form 1000 to the n over n factorial. Mm -hmm. And mathematically you can see that this, this will converge. So if I take the sum of 1000 to the n over n factorial, it will converge, Ex actually it converges to uh, exponential of 1000. which is a very large number, but it does converge. But that is what he calls convergence in the sense of geometer. So mathematically it does converge, but if you compute the first thousand terms, they will get bigger and bigger. Only after the thousands terms will they start decreasing again. While the other series here uh, actually does not converge. It does not converge because n the n factorial here in the numerator grows faster than the 1000 to the n. 
However, the first 1000 terms will get smaller and smaller. And it means that for practical purposes, if we are able to show that the remainder does not go too, too quickly, this is actually useful. So I can truncate my, my series and obtain some useful information. And there's actually a case in uh, quantum electrodynamics for the uh, what is called the anomalous uh, magnetic moment of the of the electron or of the muon where people have made a computation like that with Feynman diagrams to a very large order with thousands of diagrams and even though we know the series does not converge up to I think maybe 10 uh, uh, 10 digits after the decimal point, it, it gives a really very precise uh, result, which is really, it coincides with experimental results to a very high degree of precision. All right, so that's all for today. Thanks a lot for watching. Take care. Bye.